Welcome back, everyone, to another episode on Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy. So if you're new to my show, please be sure to hit the subscribe button. Today, we have a new guest to the show, and her name is Natalie Brunel. She is a podcast host, an educator, and a media commentator in Bitcoin space. So without further ado, Natalie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to this. Pleasure to have you here, Natalie. If we could just start first... What is your origin story? You know, what sparked your interest in learning about journalism, especially in finance and economics? Sure. It's been a very winding journey, one that I did not expect to get me to where I am today. Um, I'm originally from Poland. I was born there and my family immigrated to the United States, to Chicago when I was five years old. So I don't really remember my life in Poland, but I've heard many stories about my parents' lives um, there. They grew up under communism. Um, they had very little economic hope. There was no real sense of social mobility. A lot of things happened really on the black market because prices were controlled by the government and there was a lot of scarcity. My mom would wait in lines for food. So she always dreamt of coming to the United States. And um, I remember her telling me stories of how everyone wanted things that were made in America when she was growing up. And, and America was this really this beacon for hope and opportunity. So she waited decades to be able to come. Um, they were finally able to immigrate when my mom was 38 and my dad was 41. And they really started over. They had to learn a new language, um, work multiple jobs and it was tough. So growing up, I think that that was my first my first experience and memory is just watching my parents sacrifice so much and work really, really hard just to give my brother and me a better life. And, uh, and, and I think I developed a lot of um, motivation and ambition during that time because I thought I have to become successful. I have to become financially secure because this was really my mom's dream and, and it took her so long to, to come to the U.S. And so now I have the chance because I get to go to school here. And um, and things were going, you know, uh, as good as they could be during that time. It was like the early 90s. My parents worked really, really hard and they were finally able to afford a home, a townhouse outside of uh, Chicago. And I moved there for, for high school and then I went off to college. And while I was in college, the great financial crisis hit and my parents lost everything. They had to file for bankruptcy. We lost our home. And so that was like another pivotal moment for me because I, I think a seed was planted and I thought, how could this happen? Um, how could this happen to people who are working really, really hard, playing by all the rules, paying their taxes, working multiple jobs just to take care of their kids. And suddenly they lose their homes, but these guys on Wall Street get bailed out. And so I was kind of um, confused. And I think it lit a fire in me to pursue investigative journalism. I, I knew I wanted to work in storytelling because I grew up watching news and TV and movies. Um, a lot of that helped my parents and me learn English actually growing up. Um, but I didn't have that fire to really hold people accountable and really be that kind of a watchdog journalist. So I set off on my career and in my first market, I became an investigative reporter. I really chased after stories about public corruption, which totally makes sense now, right? I was like, I want to hold the powerful accountable. Um, but what's crazy is I didn't understand money. I did not understand what really went wrong, what led to the financial crisis, because none of us are really taught that in school. We're not taught about the stock market and how to invest and what money printing is and what fractional reserve banking is. So I feel like I was sort of um, doing my best without the, the knowledge that I really needed. And I didn't get that knowledge until I learned about Bitcoin, which came um, like seven years after I started my, my journalism career. And by that point, I had witnessed and reported on the country becoming so much more divided and everyone turning against each other and putting themselves in two camps or two teams. And it's, oh, it's the left's fault or it's the right's fault. And 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 I probably was guilty of that as well. I thought this is all just it's because of politics. Um, but the but what I realized through Bitcoin is it's actually our financial system that is broken. And thank goodness for Bitcoin, because I think it's the literally the only solution that exists out there that could work to help fix a lot of these problems. And it's not going to be easy and it won't be overnight. But Bitcoin is literally, I think, the only thing that will remedy the biggest problems in society, which are all related to our economic system and our financial system. And um, and so I began to podcast about it and and it turned into my full time job, which is crazy. 
Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Well, I really liked hearing the story about, you know, obviously your upbringing and then how that had an impact, you know, seeing the challenges, obviously, you know, through your parents, but also lessons that were learned and you talking about, you know, that lesson of understanding, you know, the history of, of money, which I think is really important for any human being, especially during this time of, of uncertainty and challenges and, uh, and a lot of scarcity. So a question I have is, you know, what was the biggest lesson that you learned through diving deeper in, in the history of money? And if you could maybe share that with my listeners. Uh, that's a great question. I think the biggest lesson was really understanding inflation. Prior to the pandemic, I really never heard anyone talking about inflation. And I think most of us, um, we live our lives accepting the fact that things just get more expensive. That's just the way it is. It's a it's a reality and no one questions it and no one no one fights it. Um, and so when I learned about the history of money and and really diving into how money is issued and who controls money and what is money backed by, and today it's not backed by anything. I mean, literally, they just print endless units in the United States. Um, it really made me realize how much that affects the people who are within the economy, us, the workers. And um, and the more that money is uh, issued, the more units that are created, it dilutes the value of everyone's of everyone's money, essentially. And and I didn't realize how corrosive that is and how um, it's essentially a regressive tax that none of us agreed to or voted on. I mean, did, do you ever remember a ballot where you agreed to 2% inflation? And 2% doesn't sound like a lot, right? You don't really notice prices going up by 2% a year, but zoom out 35 years later, your money is worth half of what it was. And so people have to put their money to work, so to speak. So you you work to earn your money and then you have to go put your money to work. And, and now we've come to a place where we've become very financialized. Um, people's homes are their savings accounts. They have to become real estate investors and they have to become um, stock traders and investing in equities that they may, may or may not care about or understand, but hey, the number is going up and it's completely decoupled from what the company's actual value or revenues are. And things are so just backwards. And the other thing I learned is that we've gone through cycles of different countries being the global reserve currency and having that power to issue more units um, and just how much... Um, privilege comes with that, that I didn't realize the United States enjoyed for so long. And now there are some tectonic shifts within the global system that are changing because we've gone so far into debt and, and other countries are now saying, well, if you can weaponize your currency, which we do, um, why would we continue to purchase your bonds and treasuries? Why would we continue to essentially finance what, what you're doing at the expense of everyone else? And so I think that we're actually at the beginning of a massive shift where countries are moving away from our global reserve currency, the dollar, and starting to form other systems and deciding whether or not to go back to a more commodity-based system. We used to be on the gold standard. And I think that these shifts will have massive implications and impacts. Um, and the countries that issued the reserve currency, including the United States, they always sacrifice something, which is essentially the industrial and the working class, because you have to export the currency and make it very artificially strong, which ultimately weakens your industrial and working class base. Um, and we've seen that. We've seen in the United States, the middle class completely hollowed out because it's cheaper to send the labor overseas, whereas it's more expensive here because our dollar is artificially so strong. Um, so there are all these implications, right? And when you start pulling uh, um, the layers back, you realize that our system is completely broken because it's manipulated. Um, there's a country or countries that issue these currencies and there's nothing backing them. They can issue it with the stroke of a key, devaluing everyone's money. And the people who are closest to that system, the people closest to the money printer or who have the big corporations or who are politically connected, they see the benefits of that newly printed money first and can put it to work. Um, and everyone else suffers downstream, which is why it really, over the long run, impoverishes entire nations. And we are seeing that. And we're not seeing that just in the United 
United States, but all over the world where um, fiat currencies are are the standard. And so I hope with Bitcoin, we can actually change that and allow people to save in a form of currency, in a form of money and, and a form of capital that can never be manipulated, that can never never be debased. And that really is yours, yours truly to own and bear as, um, as a true bearer instrument and as a form of hard money. When a lot of individuals, you know, including myself, you know, hear about these systematic problems, you know, within the financial world, they could get really uncomfortable, right? They could get fearful. And then like the next step is obviously to think, how can they protect their wealth, right? How can they protect themselves? So a question I have for you is, you know, you've sit down with some of the, you know, most brilliant minds in like the investor world. Um, you know, what what are some of the biggest learnings that you've learned, you know, from these investors that you'd want to share? Yeah, I've learned a lot. I mean, I was really humbled through this whole process because growing up, um, especially with two parents who didn't, you know, they didn't grow up in the United States. They they didn't grow up investing in the stock market. They were actually very afraid of it. They grew up essentially saving in cash and and in gold and and stocks and real estate is where you wanted to be over the last couple of decades. That is where all of the inflation and all of the newly printed money tended to to pool. Um, and so what I learned is that really in order to build and preserve wealth, you need to own hard, scarce assets. You need to own something that they can't just easily print. And, and although yes, they can build more buildings um, and they can issue maybe more stock shares, it's not as easy or as fast is they can dilute the system with actual just dollars and cash. So you do not want to be saving in cash. Um, and you can't just create new beachfront property, right? There are limit, there are there, there's a reason why in real estate it's like location, location, location. Like you can't just create more land. You have to um build on top of what exists. And so um really I I learned the value of of investing in property and investing in hard, scarce assets that cannot be easily created. And the hardest asset that has ever been created is Bitcoin. Um, and so I know that a lot of people look at the space and they're skeptical and they've seen crypto at large have uh, issues and scams. And I urge people to you know, take the time to actually learn about the differences between Bitcoin and the rest of crypto and really take the time to study because this is truly the most revolutionary and empowering technology that has existed. Um, and the two most important aspects of Bitcoin are it is absolutely scarce and finite. No one can ever print more units, so no one can ever dilute your purchasing power. And it is completely decentralized. There is no one who has power or control or who can influence or change the network, which is why it will remain the same and immune to any of the manipulation that we've seen in the current system. So it's really empowering that now anywhere in the world, literally, I mean, there are people in other countries and developing nations who can't buy purchases or buy uh, shares of Apple stock, right? Um, they can't just like hop on their phone and purchase a fraction of a skyscraper in Manhattan to try to save for the future. But you can start to accumulate fractions of Bitcoin in whatever currency that you um, you have in the country where you live. And I just think it's it's just an incredible way to start to save for the future on top of the fact that it is also this incredible payment network where you can transfer value instantly globally without a middleman involved taking a cut and without surveilling everything that you're doing. Right. And even based off what you've just said, you know, you've clarified some reasons why, you know, Bitcoin is the most perfectly engineered type of money, you know, in terms of like a harder asset. So a question I'm curious to ask is like, you know, in your opinion, why do you think Bitcoin is the best performing hard asset in history or in terms of the making of history in like the next upcoming decade? Yeah, so I, I think it actually really just comes down to supply and demand in, in everything else that exists. When when the demand increases, there has been a lot of um, energy that is dedicated to creating more of it, right? So if there's more demand for gold, people are out there trying to mine more gold. Um, if, if the demand for real estate increases, then people are out there constructing and building homes. Um, and, and, and with everything else, you really can create more units. Um, even if it's a small amount, you can sort of increase it to some degree to meet the demand. Whereas um, with Bitcoin, it is a fixed supply. And the more demand there is, that obviously is going to push the price up. And that's why it's been performing so incredibly, uh, incredibly well 
um, when you zoom out, obviously very volatile in the short run because it's a very small asset class. But when you zoom out, it, the number has been going up, I mean, since the beginning, thousands of percent, because no matter what, no matter how many people want to buy Bitcoin, there can never be more than 21 million. And there are a lot of people who are holding on, who know the value of it and who know the future potential, who will not let go at any price. Um, and so when you when you meet that finite supply and increasing demand, it just kind of makes sense that you see the performance um, doing much better than a lot of the other asset classes out there. You know, with any investment, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's gold, real estate, anything, um, you know, it's always important to talk about risks. So mm -hmm. what are the potential <laughs> risks that could play out with Bitcoin? Sure. So there are definitely risks. Um, and especially if you are looking for something where, you know, you need to make a, 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 um, a significant purchase in the next year, two years, maybe even four years, then I, I would weigh carefully how much you allocate to Bitcoin because the cycles and the drops, um, they can be very volatile and, and the dips can be very severe. So if you are trying to maybe purchase a home and you're looking for a down payment and all your money's in Bitcoin and all of a sudden, it gets cut in half, that could be um that could be pretty, pretty meaningful and it could prevent someone from being able to take that next step and, and purchase a home, for example. Um the other risk is, you know, there could be a, a technological bug that we're not aware of. Now, I think the risk of this is very low. Um, one of the reasons is because this is open source code and and there have been uh, tens of thousands, if not millions of people who have examined it um, and, and who would arguably be able to spot something that could could pose a significant risk. But at the same time, you know, the future is uncertain. Um, and so there could be some sort of bug that no one is aware of. But um, I, I'm certainly not worried about the risks that other people see when they first start learning about Bitcoin, which is, oh, there's going to be a competitor that that takes over and is going to exceed um, the adoption of Bitcoin. I, I just don't see that as possible at all. I think the power of network effect is extremely strong. Um, I think that would be like saying we're going to fork the English language and all start talking in this new dialect and we're going to expect everyone in the world to adopt it um, or we're going to all go to this new version of the internet. I mean, it is very difficult to knock over uh, the the king of something that is acquired network effect. And that has certainly happened with Bitcoin. Um, and I also don't think it would be possible to replicate the decentralization because when Bitcoin was very, very young, um, you know, if you were to expend a certain amount of energy, you could potentially do a 51% attack and take over the network and potentially change something. But now it's so powerful and there's so there are so many nodes um, and 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 the hash rate that's defending it is so, so strong. It would take billions of dollars to potentially, to try to um, take hold of the network for even a couple minutes, and then and then that person or the attacker would easily be thrown off, and Bitcoin would continue on as it was before. So it's like I don't see a lot of risks on the technical side. I, I certainly don't see risks in terms of um, where we're going on the macro with our economies just printing money. I think that they're going to go in the direction of more printing. So again, you want to be in hard scarce assets. Uh, and I just, I don't see the risks that maybe some people see when they're first learning about Bitcoin and wondering, could it, could it survive? And what are other, you know, hard risks, you know, scarce assets that you think investors also need to position themselves in? Well, I mean, I think that Bitcoin is going to outperform all of these, but certainly I'm someone who believes in in real estate um, because I do want to own a home and I want to live in it. I can't live in my Bitcoin, right? So, um, so I do think that real estate is is still and always will be a great investment. I, I wish that more people actually um, were invested in the companies that they that they place their money in when it comes to the stock market. And what I mean by that is I, I had a guest on the show and he said something that totally encapsulated how I feel about equities, which is that people look at stocks today as just they're renting them. They're not, they don't care about actually owning them. They're not invested in what the company's doing, what the, pro what products they're putting out, the services, all that. They just know that it's a better way to store their money and the number is going to hopefully go up. And if it goes down, they're, they're ready and able to sell it. I feel like the stock market should 
should really be about ownership. Like you believe in this company, you believe in their products, you use them in your, your actual life. And so you want to be an owner of the company. And so many people don't view the stock market that way, which is why the valuations versus the stock price, I mean, there's everything is so decoupled. Um, so, so I, I wish that the stock market was more in tune with, with reality and, and, um, and outcomes and, what the companies are actually worth. Uh, and then, and then, you know, I used to find gold to be a good investment and I don't think it's a bad one, but I just think Bitcoin, um, has better monetary properties. The fact that right now, I mean, I have no idea how much gold the United States has, and you would have to perform significant audits, uh, to, to really know where is the gold? What is it worth? Is it real? Whereas Bitcoin is verifiable and extremely portable. And you could literally send a billion dollars from here to another country within the matter of, of seconds or minutes. Um, so I think that gold is actually going to be replaced by Bitcoin. And so in, in, even just that asset class, I want people to think about the fact that Gold is like a 10 to 12 trillion dollar asset. Bitcoin's just a 1.23 trillion dollar asset. If it does eat more and more into gold and potentially take over gold, let's say it becomes like a 10 trillion dollar asset, that is hundreds of thousands of dollars per coin. So I think it's a huge asymmetric opportunity for people who really want to build wealth. We're talking about, you know, different assets there. Um, when it came to quality companies, which I'm glad you brought up because I feel you know, it's really important if anyone invests any money, you know, to have that ownership mindset where it's like, okay, if this company did go down, I like it. I want to buy more because I know the value and the worth of the actual. Mm -hmm. So my question is like, I'm curious to ask you, like, what is your opinion on in the investing world right now? You know, the difference between an investor and a speculator and, you know, having that mindset that if they are investing to think of quality decision-making. Well, I just think that we've been incentivized to speculate. Um, it, it It's just so crazy to me that in order to just preserve the money that people earn in whatever industry, hairdressers, accountants, doctors, that they have to risk and, and go into the stock market. And we've created all these tools and vehicles, right, to make it a little bit easier or more passive. Oh, the, the S&P index and this index and this ETF. But at the end of the day, it's all no one has the time to do the research that it would really take in order to understand everything that is happening at these companies. I mean, people in their portfolios, especially given the index funds, they're investing in thousands of companies that they probably know nothing about. They don't know who the who what the governance is, what the products are, what what risks and what liabilities exist. I mean, it's just wild to me that we've just completely normalized putting money in the stock market as in closing your eyes and hoping that you get 7% every year. Meanwhile, literally the rate of the supply of money increasing has averaged 7% since about the 1960s. So you're not even making money. You are just keeping up with the rate at which they are expanding the supply of money. You're keeping up with inflation. And then they give you this CPI number of 2%, which is total baloney because they can manipulate that basket of goods. And everyone knows that prices are going up far higher and faster than 2% every year. And certainly we see it um, in the grocery store as well as in the real estate market and everything. And so it just, the whole system becomes very distorted. And it's wild to me that everything is, the incentives are so, so broken. And now we have things like the airline companies, right? They're all bankrupt, but their stock prices, um, they've performed very well over the last couple of decades because they do share buybacks and they pay their executives ridiculous amounts of money through these portfolio packages. So is it is it any wonder that you have these workers who none of the money goes to them or into actually building better infrastructure or investing in the planes and the maintenance and like great engineers years, it's gone to the tippy top to the to the executives who have those portfolio packages because everything is about the stock price. It's crazy. And it leads to things that are happening like with Boeing now, right? Because you've spent decades focusing on the share price and not the actual products and planes. Um, so not to not to, you know, attack them, but it's just we we are we are at a place where we're all speculators. And that isn't what a healthy economy should represent. It should be about savings and really, really accumulating capital so that you can invest in productive things as opposed to just 
pumping up a stock so that, you know, your, your, your salary increases or your retirement is, is set while the product actually goes down, down the drain. Spoke a little bit about, you know, how the economy is very speculation based, but if we do think of making proper positions, because I really believe if you, if you position yourself well, you could take advantage of an opportunity or a circumstance to then perform very well. So what does this mean to you as an investor and how do you position yourself to take advantage of the right opportunities? Um, so I'm probably going to give you an answer that is unlike most of your other guests and maybe something that might make people feel a little uneasy. But uh, as I've gotten um, deeper into the space and my own knowledge of both economics as well as Bitcoin and the markets, I've become less and less diversified. And I will tell you why, because everything gets um, outperformed by Bitcoin. And so as I as I originally tried to do sort of a mix, a healthy mix of equities and precious metals and this and that and uh, baby bonds and, and Bitcoin, Bitcoin has always outperformed everything, even though it was volatile in the short run. Every, if I would have dedicated all that energy and those resources and that value to Bitcoin, I'd be sitting in a much more comfortable place. And the more that I really did learn about the technology, the mining, the energy, every, every component of it, I felt more and more comfortable with having a larger allocation. And so the money that I need to spend on expenses or, you know, everyone should have sort of an emergency fund. I'm a huge believer of that, but I am less and less diversified because I want the winner. I don't want to sell the winner for the losers. And so Bitcoin's been the winner. So I want to keep the winner. Because I know you're very passionate about Bitcoin. Um, in terms of the most influential books that you've ever read about not only Bitcoin, but like, let's say the financial system. Yeah. What would you recommend someone tuning in right now to, to to go to? Oh, so many. I mean, I I have become a huge financial book, economic book uh, nerd. They're all uh, pretty much sitting on my my shelf and my my Kindle. But um, I highly recommend the book Psychology of Money. That is fascinating. It's not about Bitcoin at all. Um, Price of Tomorrow. Also, it's not a Bitcoin book. I think Bitcoin is maybe mentioned in there once. It's really about um a system of inflation and how it's interacting with technology being a deflationary force and what that means for society and the implications for workers um, and for the future. That's a fantastic book. Um, when Money Dies, I mean, if people don't have that historical context of what happened in Weimar, Germany, and what happens when when the countries essentially just revert to printing because they want to avoid an economic uh, collapse, they actually ensue a, a much more slow and and corrosive one than if they had just let things sort of uh, fall and then rebound on its own through free market um, forces. Um, anything really by the Austrian economists too. I love Austrian economic books. This one is one I'm I'm reading now, 40 Centuries of Wage and Price Controls, How Not to Fight Inflation. So <laughs> lots of books in that in that arena. I'm curious to ask, you're big on storytelling, you're big on journalism, you've had on your podcast, you know, tremendous high profile investors, but what do you believe separates, you know, a good investor from a great investor? I mean, I think it's the ability to navigate the psychological components of these markets because, um, and that's kind of why I brought up the book Psychology of Money, human behavior is really difficult to predict and, and there are patterns and history does rhyme. But at any given time, I mean, look how many analysts said, oh, we were going to have a hard landing, right? Or or look how many analysts thought this, this would happen. Or with Bitcoin, the last cycle, they thought for sure it's going to 100. People, consensus tends to be wrong, actually. Um, sometimes it pays to be a contrarian. So I think that it's really people who can navigate those psychological um, ups and downs. Um, and and they're the people that also, when, when, when they're sort of... Um, when everything goes in the red and, and starts to go down, they have the ability to actually buy because they understand that it will go up or they have conviction like we do with Bitcoin. Um, as And and they know maybe in terms of other things when to sell. I would never sell my Bitcoin. But um, but just so people, people really need to navigate the psychological aspects of very unpredictable markets that are made from very complex components that are now global. I think another thing too is having like the knowledge, right? That competitive advantage. And, you know, I would say, you know, you've taken the time to invest in yourself, which is huge in terms of knowledge. And a question I'm curious to ask is like, 
you know, after all these interviews that you've done where you've heard different opinions or similar opinions or, you know, knowledge, right? Like you're, you're constantly improving your environment of, of people or knowledge. Um, are there any like memorable stories from any of these interviews that you want to highlight or kind of share? Well, I, the reason that I started my show was because I had a really, really big passion for Bitcoin and curiosity. I wanted to learn more about it. But what I didn't see in the marketplace was um, the more human stories behind the interviews. And I'm someone who I've always loved biographies and autobiographies and just origin stories, what really informs them, why why they are the way that they are and why they believe what they believe. And so when I was listening to all these people who many of whom came from different industries, but were all brilliant and successful in their own right, they were all talking about Bitcoin and how they came to this conclusion that it is this amazing solution to all these problems and that and that it does have the power to really transform our our, our world. I just thought, who is this person? You know, why? What got them here? What got them to understand Bitcoin? Why do they feel so strongly? What was their experience in their industry that they specialized in? And so really it just, it was, it was a hobby and a passion project. I just contacted all the people that I was actually learning from and said, can you just tell me your backstory? Like who, who are these people? I mean, some of them I've never heard of now, now I'm in the space and I feel like I'm very familiar with all the names and figures, but when I was starting out, I had no idea. I mean, people who wrote books or they were very successful maybe in finance or um, engineering, I, I had no clue who they were. So for me, it was like those human stories and each one was so unique. So if you go back to my very early episodes, like one through, I don't know, 25, one through 30, it's some of the biggest, most prominent names in the space telling you their life story, like who they were when they were young, why they wanted to pursue a certain career, how they found Bitcoin, why they believe in Bitcoin. And and for whatever reason, I think because it was so unique in the space, no one else was asking those questions and getting those backstories. Um, you know, the podcast turned into something where I could actually leave my journalism job and pursue it full time, which I'm really grateful for. So now I explore things that are more um, market driven or headline driven because I already got all those stories unless I have a brand new guest on. But I just think that those those interviews can live forever because they tell the whole story of the human behind whatever, um, you know, the topic is. And I, and I love that. So I just highly recommend anyone interested in these big names like Michael Saylor, Linda Alden, Jeff Booth, Preston Pish, go check out the early episodes. Cause you may learn something that really surprises you about them. I honestly truly love your uh, curiosity and you're definitely a people artist, right. In terms of yeah, finding out, you know, more of their, their story and bringing out the best of them, you know, in terms of, you know, your, how do I say greatest mentor that you've ever looked up to in your life? Who would that be and why? Oh, that's easy. Um, his name is Larry. I met him through my investigative work. Um, he is a really brilliant attorney who also has a passion for economics and markets and sociology and anthropology and history. And um, he has taught me more than anyone. Um, we've had fascinating discussions that ultimately led me to understanding Bitcoin. I, I purchased Bitcoin back in 2017, not knowing what it was. And honestly, looking at it as kind of like a lotto ticket, like, oh, maybe this will you know help me make money. Um, and, and he was the one who went out and he purchased the Bitcoin standard and then came back to me and said, you have to learn about this. This is like everything you stand for and believe in, and this could change your life. You have to learn about Bitcoin. And then he was the one who encouraged me to start interviewing people because I was really passionate um, and I wanted to learn more and talk to people. And I was already interviewing people in, in a different podcast with the same kind of background of, oh, you know, what's your origin story, all that. And he goes, talk to the talk to the people that you're learning from with Bitcoin, just start messaging them. And I did. Um, and so I really credit um, a lot of where I am today to him. And um, he's fantastic and brilliant. And he's the best mentor ever because he's also very tough on me. Like I, I, I think maybe it's my Eastern European immigrant upbringing or something, but I react well to tough, tough love and like tough assignments. And I, I want to be pushed. 
And Larry always pushed me. And he was, he was like, you can't be intimidated by this and don't be afraid and, and just take the risk and take the extra step to gain the knowledge and just go for it because you'll always regret not doing something. You will never regret trying something. Even if you fall down a couple of times and have to pick yourself back up and learn from failures, you will never regret that because you will grow and you will ultimately um, learn a lot, not about, not just about yourself, but about the world. That's beautiful. Well, I'm really glad to hear that you've had a mentor like him, you know, mm -hmm. come into your life because uh, it doesn't define who we are, but it does have impact on, you know, maybe ways that we think or actions that we do or behaviors um, or support systems. So I'm, I'm glad that you had that. And, um, you know, Natalie, the purpose of my show is really, you know, beyond finance, you know, to really inspire people, you know, to become the best version of themselves. And so my question to you is, you know, what is your definition of greatness? I think someone great just never gives up. And kind of going back to what I was instilled with from both my parents and and my mentors, um, nothing is ever easy. I, I, I think that today a lot of people feel entitled, like just, just for showing up, they deserve X, Y, or Z, or hey, government, ha you know, give me money for, for just being here and having a hard time. I think that that is the absolute wrong mentality. I think that that is actually a weak mentality. I think that the, the, the most strength and character and value comes from hard work, from pushing yourself, from from challenging yourself, from taking on risk, um, and and really from from learning and growing. I, I think that the most confident, strong people have a background of struggle, and they overcame that struggle. Um, they didn't shy away from it. They didn't um, fall down and give up. Um, they allowed it to help them grow. And so I just really encourage people not to be so afraid. I think a lot of us, it's we're our own worst enemies and worst critics. No one else is thinking about us as much as we think that they are. And today we live in a world, especially with social media, where everyone is driven to compare themselves. But you really need to focus inward and decide what you want um, and go learn as much as you can and challenge yourself and try things. And if it doesn't work the first time, try again and again. And if you really want something, you know, let that fire sort of drive you and grow because I really do believe in, in that core um, premise of the American dream that you could, you could be from any background, any socioeconomic class, and with hard work and education and perseverance, you can accomplish anything. But I think so many people have lost that ethos. So many people have just felt kind of hopeless and like they want to give up or they want, they want people to just help. I think anyone is capable of greatness. You just have to really try and not give up and, um, and believe in yourself. I think believe in yourself is, uh, a really key ingredient. You know, if you do feel comfortable sharing, was there ever like a big setback or, you know, really hard challenge where you had to overcome the challenge maybe with an anti-fragile mindset? I mean, my whole life, I, I think that, um, and I'm, again, I'm, I, it was so tough during these experiences, but I'm so glad for them now because they really did strengthen me. But, you know, moving here uh, when I was very little, knowing that, um, you know, I don't know the language. It's a different culture, just really struggling. Um, it's not easy when you totally just move your life and transplant it to a new place where everything is foreign to you and seeing my parents struggle and the financial insecurity that we had, and then trying to really make it at school, um, and, and trying to fight for, you know, the, the spots in the college. And then when I entered the news profession, man, that was really tough. And the feedback that you get and everyone's, you know, ripping apart your appearance and the way you sound and um, everything I feel like I've done has challenged me in one way or another. And it's been really tough along the way, but I'm so glad that I never gave up and I kept going. And I think that at the end of it, what gave me strength is not just the fact that I was doing, I was kind of doing it for not just myself. I was really doing it to justify the sacrifice my parents had made and for this future family that I envisioned. Like, I think that it's really powerful when you um, are working towards something that's not just about you. It's about something outside of you. And in fact, if you guys haven't read um, Man's Search for Meaning, I think it is by um, Victor, 
I forgot his last name, but it's about this Holocaust survivor who, um, he, he kind of analyzed who was able to survive those most horrifying circumstances. And it was the people who were living for something outside of themselves, who were living for their children or a loved one, or just, it, it wasn't just about them. They didn't go inward and they weren't selfish. They were trying, they were, they had something greater than themselves that they were um, waiting for. And so I, I think that that has driven me too, because I just, I want to create a better life for my family than what we grew up with. And, um, and that passion sort of just keeps me going. And I'm always, I'm okay saying, I don't know something and I want to learn. Cause I think learning is the best feeling in the whole world. And, and we will all constantly, there's never, you will never have learned enough. There's always something to learn, which I think is really fun and it makes life amazing. So truly appreciate that. Thanks for sharing. And what is, you know, one quote that you live by? Make the most of yourself for that is all there is of you. Beautiful. Um, and Natalie, you know, now that you have a feel of my podcast, you know, and kind of what it's all about, who is a future guest, you know, someone that, you know, personally that you think would be a great fit for this show? Oh gosh. I mean, I, I hope you have more Bitcoiners on. I just think that they're the most incredible people I've ever met. Um, really humble and thoughtful and, and brilliant. And um, so you should definitely have Jeff Booth and Preston Pish and Michael Saylor and Lynn Alden, all those. I mean, yeah, they're amazing. Where is the best place for my viewers to find your work? And also on top of that, you know, are there any other last things that you want to, you know, end off this episode with? Yeah, I just really encourage people to learn about Bitcoin. I think it is the most important technology of our lifetime. Um, there are so many resources out there and it all caters to how people best learn. There are podcasts, there are videos that are more visual, there are books. Um, I have a, a welcome course, swan.com slash welcome that teaches you about Bitcoin in an hour. Um, there's podcasts like mine, Coin Stories. There are amazing books like the Bitcoin Standard. So the information is out there. It's accessible. It's free. It's in any length of format that you can want it. And I highly recommend and encourage people to learn about it. I will be sure, you know, to put that all in the, in the podcast notes. And um, I want to take this last little bit of time, you know, to really thank you for being here today, Natalie. I've enjoyed not just interviewing you, but also learning from you and, uh, and also giving you the opportunity, you know, to express your voice. Thank you so much for having me.